Okay, um, because Wendy has said some of this, and some of this is partly about assuaging some legitimate fears about what the semantic web isn't, right? So um, I seem to have been associated through my career. Well, I started off as a did my first degree in philosophy and psychology. So those two pretty disreputable terms in, in some people's mindsets. Then I moved into AI. Then I, so every, <laughs> semantic web. I mean, kind of, what does that say? Incendiary terms. Um, and we sometimes have to reinvent these terms to get ourselves off the hook. Um, when, when, when the thing went popular, this um, Scientific American article with Hendler and, uh, and Tim Berners-Lee and so on uh, appeared, and uh, Lassala, uh, people got a very odd idea that the semantic web would somehow be a lot of a good old-fashioned AI magic with a bunch of software agents who somehow would use information off this kind of stack of standards to kind of weave a web of proof and trust and just hopeless. I mean, AI never had a hope of doing that on standalone kind of knowledge-based systems, let alone scaling to web scale. So we got a bit sidetracked for a number of reasons. In fact, most of what I'm going to be talking about today kind of uses this bit of the stack. You know, this bit here, okay. All this stuff is really hard. Uh, it needs loads of social mediation. Uh, we have no idea. We think it's probably pretty well intractable in some very serious points for some quite interesting mathematical and theoretical uh, uh, reasons. So that view of the web kind of got in the way. Uh, there's been some very excellent work, I should do say, done in the area of description logics. Sorry. Yeah, I'm going to. You're going to, you're going to get a lot of that, yeah, I'm afraid. I mean, I don't want this to... Can I just say, can I do a check? Who's, who's heard of DPpedia? Who's looked at it? DPpedia, no? Okay, yeah, maybe a couple. Okay, so that'll be... This isn't meant to be kind of like a lecture, but there needs to be a bit of kind of... Just, just enough of it to give you a sense of demystifying some of this terminology. Uh, I'm not going to explain XML, but I will talk about your eyes. Um, okay, let's have a look. Um, so when he's talked about this move from what's called a web of documents to a web of data, this is just an observation that when, when Berners-Lee came up with the HTTP and HTML protocols, what they did was took a world of hideously complicated and disjoint document management systems and put a very thin layer of abstraction on top of them. In the same way that when... Khan and Surf abstracted the internet protocol. They took a bunch of issues about actual physical connections between machines and abstracted them to uh, an abstract level, They're talking about addresses and uh, uh, de you know, domain name servers, where you could needn't have to worry about exactly how one machine connected to another. It was through a virtual routing system. And pretty well that same trick with, with HTML and HTTP was to kind of come up with a protocol that could sit on top of a variety of operating systems and machines and allow you to imagine you had one extended docuverse, okay? Well, um, the plan is that's the same kind of idea for this web of data. And in particular, what agitates us is that many pages contain factoids. And we'll get into the epistemology a bit a little bit because I think it's interesting. Um, there's elements inside web pages, tons of it inside bloody Excel spreadsheets, um, quite a lot of it in databases, which would be kind of interesting. We had a way of abstracting away from the detail and linking those components up. So point one is this web of linked data has a very fine grain size, which will present problems and opportunities, because you're going to be giving essentially web addresses to atomic facts. And it's a very, very simple-minded epistemology as well as you, as you first come across it, but it's interesting how, uh, with some simple principles, that can scale. At Southampton, I, as I say, I kind of come from a background in, in rather classic AI and have been involved in, in psychology, for, uh, in cognitive psychology department for many years. I moved into engineering uh, uh, school in, in 2000, and um, a lovely kind of phrase, uh, certum quad factum, you know what you build. And it's kind of interesting to be surrounded by engineers in a sense of... Uh, some of this stuff just works, um, and, uh, uh, or it doesn't. And at the point at which we were kind of talking about the semantic web, we, a number of us thought, this is already way too complicated. I know how hard AI is in general case, and we're not going to get it to scale at the web scale. So what are the simplest principles? In 2003, when we built this system here, um, and the only reason I will show you this little bit of um, eye candy is because somebody said, where's Southampton? And... Uh, Okay, so um, 
This is, uh, this is, let me start it off. Okay. Um, so this was a system where we had to imagine that the semantic web or this web of linked data exists before it did. Okay. So we would take, there's Southampton by the way. Okay, that's the Isle of Wight. This is the English Channel. So we're on the sunny south coast. Well, it's 51 degrees. <laughs> so... Um, the, uh, the whole notion here is that we imagined a world in which project databases from our research councils and people's publications and people's CVs and uh, institutional repositories were being actually presented in this way. And we then essentially built a, mock a system running with all the technology of triples and some of this RDF I'll talk about as if that were the case. And in 2003, we showed this system and said, this is what we could have. Uh, and, and, and in many respects, that's been uh, uh, driving us in this, in this space uh, ever since. So if we can go back to the... I won't talk about that in any more detail. Uh, let's go back to, to this. Wendy uh, talked about another project we had. And again, one of the things with the semantic web or this linked data web is that people hear about it and, and can't feel it. It's a bit like dark fiber, you know. Where the hell is this stuff? If it's so clever, you know, where, just show me where to go and, uh, and feel it. So, for example, let us have a look at... Um, this is what I hate about these resolutions. You never get quite enough real estate on the screen, but... Um, uh, okay. Yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm fine here. Okay, so this is, this is a live connection to a thing called RKB Explorer. It's a... This is a live running version of that, of that imagined system back in 2003, running um, 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 in live. It's about 240 different knowledge bases representing information in computing in Europe in this uh, set of standards I'll be talking about. And you can, uh, you can look stuff up. And essentially, it's a network um, research tool it's a research intelligence tool, essentially. At this point, it's a bit dumb. It thinks I might be a research project rather than a, a person. So I'm going to actually ask it to uh, 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 find me. So it's now going to be loading. It's loading information. It's found about me in this linked data format, people, organizations, publications. The great thing about academic world is we're not interested in much. <laughs> okay. We have this kind of closed world of citations. There I am. There is um, um, Wendy. Must be there probably. That's interesting. Uh, there we go. It must be. Must have to get to her through someone else. So Dave Duraw is, uh, is a colleague and, in fact, uh, that's how I get to Wendy through the link here. Dave is the mediating link between me and Wendy. And these are our, essentially our communities of practice being represented. Is it calculated in real time? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's all being calculated in real time yeah, with real data. We work so much together, but we have yeah. published lots together. Yeah. So. And there's quite a lot of interesting stuff about in this system, if you were to look at it. Not least, there's a whole bunch of services that have to do with co-reference resolution, and I'll come on to that, because this is a big issue, is how many versions of Nigel Shabal all there and the rest of it. Um, uh, from far too many for comfort, some people would say. <laughs> okay, I don't... Um, let me give you another sense of where this thing is. Does this thing exist? There's a rather nice... Uh, um, rather nice application called Sigma. Sigma is um, a tool from the University, of, from the Derry Research Institute. I'm going to type in, well, again, I'll be a little bit vain, uh, put myself in there. Um, it's now searching the linked data web in real time and pulling out all the information as linked RDF it knows about me. Um, and it's quite a lot of information. It's taking information from the DBLP, which is the Computer Science Publications, databases, Wikipedia, video lectures, various places where people have placed annotation in this new form. Um, yeah, I know I have. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's the trouble when you try and do live demos as well. Okay, so this is, this is information that it knows about me. Um, pulled together. So this is a search engine uh, for the semantic web, Okay. So it, you can light it up, and it's surprising how rich this is becoming. So what I want to do now is, is get under the skin of that a little bit. Um, to give you a sense of just how joined up that might be, if we were to go to this resource here, uh, it's, these are all of my linked data publications that it knows about. 
I can choose to look at one of them. And this is the kind of, if you like, the network structure that is underlying linked data. Already billions and billions of triples. This is interesting because immediately we see here this one single publication also has a see also or a same as equivalency. This is telling me that this web address for the paper I'm looking at is equivalent to this web, web address for the object here as well. Okay? So it is there. It's not a, a promissory note at this point. And so why don't we have a little look at how it is constituted and what it uh, consists of. Okay, and they're just interesting to look at. I could have explored Nosh Contractor. You don't have to be a semantic web geek to be, he has done, okay? It's quite, it's quite surprising. You, wouldn't prob you probably wouldn't have thought all that RDF was out there about you. So, um, um, <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, there you go. Wendy talked about this, 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 this paper where we, in fact, the, the principles are due to, to, to Tim, actually. Um, First principle, a URI. A URI is nothing more than a web address for an atomic fact, if you will, expressed as a triple. Here are some URIs. It gets very comp. You don't want to get into kind of redirection protocols. The actual stuff underneath here is just a little bit more complex than this because it turns out to actually put me down the, uh, down the internet, uh, it's quite difficult. Uh, you know, it's not enough bandwidth to actually get people or institutions down the bandwidth. So if you're going to try and represent the world in this logicist picture theory of meaning way that the kind of where this is going to suggest, you've got to have a way of describing them, a non-information resource, which is me, as opposed to an information resource, which is a document describing me. There's some finessing around how these things get dereferenced. So not everybody's browser will have a plugin that will be able to show them this linked data web just yet in the way that I was showing you. Well, you could with the tools I've just shown you to date, but it isn't entirely straightforward. Let me just give you a sense of what you get. So when he talked about, um, uh, this is quite an interesting one. This is, this is me represented in a, so this, this browser plugin allows me to read RDF. And what RDF is doing it's showing me a subject verb object or value predicate value associations. It's just about the earliest and simplest AI representation language on the planet. Um, it has some surprisingly uh, powerful features. You can do some kind of cute stuff with it. The key thing to note here is that these predicates here, like created by source descriptions, these are, these are from various ontologies. So these are conventions that we come up with in this world where we get together and a community decides that to describe people or conferences or educational data, it will develop a vocabulary. Not one overarching vocabulary, but a vocabulary for a community. When we come to mix and link these networks, we can mix these vocabularies. That's one of the very powerful things about computation in this model is that it's schemaless. It doesn't require you to have fixed pre-existing models that conceptualize in one universal way. And I'll try and get uh, under the skin of that as well a little bit. So um, that was a URI. A URI was nothing more than a name for an individual. And it, depending on the variety of URI you type, you'll actually get a an object back which you can interpret with a standard web browser. So this is a URI for, for one, of my, one of our colleagues um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the school. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to point a web address, a dereferenceable thing, for every damn thing you can imagine. This isn't just everybody on the planet, but all the properties they might have, or all of the um, different types of value of those properties you might have. This seems extremely promiscuous. Uh, it seems a very odd thing to do, but it turns out to be not that difficult. Uh, you have to have some interesting conventions about how you design these URIs to persist. You can have URIs for temporal events, epochs, eras, point semantics. You can have uh, URIs for people, as I say, for countries, for categories. And you will associate those in such a way that when you put them into a web application, you'll get something back. You'll get a description of the object uh, back. You can dereference them. 
the essential idea behind RDF, the Research Description Framework, is it's a language for specifying languages. So it allows you to use a triple-based representation. This is very, very simple representation. Um, here there's a guy uh, who's got, uh, got a, uh, a particular uh, property uh, name, predicate, and this is its literal representation. Every bit of these threes, these triples, can itself be a web addressable or a simple value. Okay. So a triple, can each element of which can be a web address or uh, you can get down to a particular value. This one is from our resource DPpedia, which is uh, an entry, uh, I'll talk about that more, for Berlin telling us its population at some current time. Interesting point is this. The issue about provenance, where it comes from, this is handled in this notation. It's not as if you're left wondering where the hell that information came from. And you will make judgments about what information resources and the latency of that information you will trust to, li you will trust to uh, believe. The point about a representation that simple is you can represent it as a simple graph. And you can do a lot of very efficient graph-based analysis nowadays. Uh, we didn't used to have particularly efficient ways of doing database storage with them. Now we do, or indexing them. Now we do. Um, I, I could take a fragment here and a fragment here, and obviously I can do a bit of a trick and join those up. I can link. I can link directly if there's an equivalence, or I can assert in this language that this fragment or this URI is the same as another URI and pull in another information source. Okay, is that? I mean, it's as simple as that. They're really. Sorry? Well, you can use as many ontologies as you like, and I'll show you some examples. Yeah, there are, I mean, in fact, the curious thing about the queries that we'll look at is that I'm using five, six, seven, eight ontologies in, in one query. Okay. That's a beguilingly powerful idea, it turns out. Um, there are some examples, as I said, where I'm asserting equivalences. And, of course, in this world, you need to have a tool... This is no good just having all of these ideas without a decent infrastructure to support you. So we now have, uh, interestingly, one thing you actually need quite early on is a service which goes out there and looks for all the equivalences of URIs that might be me or might be Paris or might be some other interesting object. So this is actually, it's found quite a few equivalences here, what their sources are. And one of the interesting things about this world is which you assume to be a canonical characterization or some set of canons for describing the objects of interest. Yeah? Can I ask a question? If I'm a person and I'm looking for myself, yeah. do I have any power to delete ontologies that I have already uh, Well, uh, probably not. Uh, it would be... Uh, <laughs> uh, you can create your own ontology for yourself. That's no, what you can do. Yeah. Could have been associated with something else. Yeah, oh, well, it yeah. depends whether the URI. I mean, so if the URI is falsely uh, co-referenced, okay, you can go to a service like this and assert the, uh, the, the the failure of the identity. Yeah, you can do that kind of management. So there's URI management if you have a, you know, if people choose to believe that you're right about that. Well, yeah. Almost certainly, services will evolve to do that for you. It's going to have to, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, with, this is. I guess what I'm trying to get a sense of is that this isn't all promissory at this point and we can begin to do some quite interesting things. And where it gets interesting, I mean, already I can build a search engine, um, and this is a result from about two years ago, in fact, where you go and harvest all the RDF you can find and then start to look at its structure. What is the net? What is the overall graph that was RDF at some point looking like? Um, and the thing you start to notice is, um, well, this, is, this was quite a while ago, so it's quite a small, small fragment of the RDF world. They've got about 73 million objects, uh, under 21 million links between them, uh, lots of different classes. And as you start to do the analysis on the shape of those class hierarchies, what you notice is that it's, it's, there's power laws, there are scale-free aspects to this. There are some super-dominant concepts which crop up time and time again in this world, the concept of personhood, place, you know, um, won't be surprising what some of these are um, and how richly linked and interlinked some of these are. And you also can start to map how this is actually a map 
uh, of the 200 top most important concepts in our class association graph. And these are languages. So this is uh, the language that is used by uh, live journal, the vocabulary or the ontology for live journal. This is uh, one for um, DBpedia. This is one for friend of a friend or fove, the way in which the way in which people describe people in this RDF world. So there are these, these kind of little clusters of different color are privileged vocabularies that are being used to describe this semantic web in general. We don't know very much about the shape of this network, and it has some very odd characteristics for reasons we'll go and have a look at now. So... How am I doing? I've been going for, what, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, yeah, 20 minutes, okay. Um, DPpedia. So this is an interesting idea. This is the view that you take all of Wikipedia in all its language variants and try and get the facts out of Wikipedia. This isn't a, just a massive piece of natural language analysis. What they have done is done some rather cute things. They've taken, for example, all of the class hierarchy you can get out of the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the descriptors and the indexing. They've taken the abstracts. They've taken the info boxes, which are the little insets which tell you the basic facts about a place or a person, you know, date of birth and so on. And they've produced a large graph, okay, for all of Wikipedia. Comprises 2.9 million things, uh, people, places. The representation that is Wikipedia. Um, and... It's already interesting how this has become a crystallation point for the rest of the linked data web, that people are beginning to use this as a core reference source in this representation, and we'll begin to look at that. So that, um, and these are quite impressive numbers. There is a live, a live version of DPpedia uh, now, now going up. Um, about half a billion triples, so basic elements, uh, uh, factual elements in this resource. Now, it's a very different network resource, this, it, um, in the following sense. Let's have a little look, at, uh, little look around it. Um, you can ask some exquisitely strange questions of it. So the point I haven't actually talked about much now, because we don't have too much time to do all of this, is... Let me give you... Let me give you a question here. Actually, um, perhaps I'll do an easier one than that. Okay, this is actually... One of the great things about the resource description framework is that it's a self-describing language. So I can know nothing about Wikipedia at all. And this is called... Uh, a missing element here is a data access language for all this information on the web. So think of this as like SQL for this web of linked data. How do I go and find out anything about what is out there? And um, this is actually going to ask a question of um, the default graph we're looking at here is the DPpedia graph. It's beautifully well described site actually. Uh, and it's telling me to, to select a distinct concept where uh, that thing is a concept. So I don't know what's in Wikipedia. I'm asking it only to give me the first 50. You'll see why. I'm going to run that query. And uh, it's a pretty meaty query, actually. Those are the first 50 core categories in the DPpedia ontology. Everything from baseball players to lunar craters. Okay? Huh? A concept. What was concept? A concept is whatever... It was concepts in general. This is the concept lattice for DPpedia. Okay? In fact, we can look at one of them. Let's take the concept of a, um, oh, I don't know, an, an ice hockey player. Okay, this is a URI, remember. So this is a URI. Um, I'm going to drop this sucker into my web browser. Now, this is the D, oh, there's a bunch of ice hockey players. So we're getting into the graph that is the representation of all the knowledge that is in DPpedia, and uh, we're going to look at, Okay, we're going to look at one of the ice hockey players in particular. Um, notice, interestingly enough, as we go down here, we're probably going to see some same as us down here as well. So there's some ways in which I can relate into other. There's a word net association there, um, types, comments, uh, same as. 
Okay, there's a thing here called Freebase. Freebase, a very interesting, collectively authored, knowledge-based resource. Um, that takes me to all the information that's held in Freebase about this individual, too. Actually, they emit a lot of their data in RDF format now, too. So, you know, that was just having a little poke around with, uh, with, um, with looking at what's, what's in DPpedia. Uh, this is a slightly more interesting query. Um, this query, it's, it's, a, it's a beguiling, simple language. Notice here, these, these prefixes, these tell me which ontologies to use. There's this telling me to load up this ontology called the Yago ontology, which is a class-based description for knowledge types. This says, uh, find me a country and a population. The country has to be landlocked. The population has to be greater than 15 million. Um, and find me all the ones you know about. Okay. Now that is a very precise kind of search. It's, it's treating Wikipedia as if it was a large database. And the trick now is to imagine those linked assets, so there's not just DPpedia, as a decentralized set of databases. What would that begin to look like? So um, let's have a look at that. What's happening in that world? So you can, have, you can have some quite a lot of fun with that. Um, that was just in case I didn't have a live connection. So very, thank you very much. Actually, if I hadn't specified the English uh, 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 language characterization, I'd have got the same answer back in every uh, language variant that uh, Wikipedia holds, actually, which is a bit tedious. Um, that was called a... Sp that, that was called a, a Sparkle endpoint. It was somewhere on the web where you could go, which was giving you access to this RDF graph and allowing you to query using this data access language. DPpedia has one. This is one that exists for um, govtrack.us for a bunch of information about US government. If I go to that um, uh, Sparkle endpoint, I can ask all sorts of questions about bills and senators and various other interesting sorts of questions. You don't want to be authoring Sparkle <laughs> unless you're very propeller-headish. Uh, we haven't got the top-level tools that make this easy to do yet. But what we have is, is raw power starting to peek through. And this is how it's starting to peek through. So two years ago, uh, well, two and a half years ago, we had a linked data uh, world, an open linked data world. So this is data represented in RDF, which is entirely open. There are no restrictions on use or reuse, entirely open. DPpedia at the core of it, but the CIA fact book, for example, represented in this way, or a good chunk of US census data, or this lovely uh, geographical gazette, GeoNames, which is 8 million place names uh, around the planet, uh, or Music Brains, which is many millions of see all the recorded artists and the CDs they produced and the music tracks in RDF. Because you can immediately imagine what happens when you start to cross-associate information about a particular musician with their entry in DPpedia. You start to get this notion of some, some additionality. Um, a little later, just a little later, February 2000, it was starting, we were starting to see more information sites becoming available in this way. Um, and actually a crystallization of uh, the area into domain areas, like publications went online because they're nicely, there's a lot of metadata about publications. It's easy to convert metadata in warm format into RDF, whether it's citation networks. We like that kind of world. Music, geography, life science were always, an op interestingly enough, an early adopter of the technology was pharmaceuticals. Um, we're now getting into a world where there's a lot of stuff. The graph that is underneath this is a composition of many, many, many subgraphs, weakly connected. Nobody has done any network analysis on this at this point. We don't know what its characteristics are, where the power is, where the authority is. And so for the final part of my talk, I'd like to talk about, about what we're doing with it in government data, because I think there's a really interesting opportunity here. There's a bunch of... I would love to talk for three hours on, you know... <laughs> You perhaps wouldn't want me to, but I could, because there's a bunch of interesting questions about how we mix vocabularies, um, how you get ontological variation. And I would just say, to put my little kind of, you know, 101 philosophy hat on, 
this looks like an incredibly tractatus early picture theory of meaning, right? Realist, extensional, how boneheaded is that? Of course, the reality is that although we're making that assumption, whenever you get into finessing about just how these terms are being used and is their context being manifest, you end up with a much richer conversation. So the fact I've given some arbitrary extensional definition to a term in my ontology doesn't mean that another group can't come along and argue that your context is all wrong. I want to use it differently. I've got a different language game in play here. Here's my ontology. Okay. So it's, it's not quite as boneheaded as you might think in that regard. And I think one of the interesting things about this whole effort, by the way, if this, is, this is when we first started talking, Tim and I were sort of saying, what should we... We were talking about what we're doing is almost like philosophical engineering. It's almost like the mechanization of some aspects of epistemology that you can now get to very large-scale effects with very simple representations in a way that are intriguing. But enough of that. Let me... How long have I got left? Good. Okay, good, good, good. I want to do a rah-rah for open data. Um, and this is not unconnected with, our, with the linked data piece, but I want to give you a sense of why we're passionate about this. So... Um, Okay, this is, um, this is uh, a not yet published uh, TED talk, that uh, follow-on TED talk that Tim's doing. Um, yeah, but I don't think these slides are up. Are they up already? No, no I don't think so. Is, okay. He it, yeah, it. yeah, he delivered it. This is, a, uh, this is a year of open data. This is the thing that got us into the government in the first place, in a sense. Uh, this was some data that we released on bicycle accidents in London. Within 24 hours, somebody had built a bike spot bicycle accident avoiding uh, uh, application. People, if you give them the data, are empowered in really striking ways. I mean, it's the obvious point. Um, you may be familiar with this. It's apparently quite a, a famous course celebre uh, around, um, around uh, in the US. Um, this was where they, they, they decided to put a, a water plant in. And then somebody did a mashup on ethnicity and just noticed that in this area, you know, people who weren't black were getting the, uh, the, the, the actual uh, water fed to them. Um, the idea of opening up data and allowing people to repurpose it in various ways seems to be hugely empowering. Governments are starting to pick up on this. Um, in this case, it led to an $11 million fine when somebody had noticed that. We have the equivalent to fiscal spending transparency in the UK. That's a hard thing to drag out of people. But the fact that you can begin to get a handle on what is spent in various programs begins to hold people accountable. The Treasury in the UK is, 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 is famous for being nervous about this information being in the public domain. You, with the Recovery Initiative, are extremely uh, much further down the line, I would say, in this regard, in terms of knowing what's being spent. Now, whether you can then hold people accountable is an interesting question. Open data changes the game. Um, this is the graphs for the two uh, efforts, uh, uh, data.gov.uk here and the data.gov, the US one, um, in terms of data release. The interesting thing that we're noticing in the UK is that as we're starting to make this information available, you can produce very interesting hyper-local uh, uh, models. What people actually care about, this is the UK postcode. We can't get a lot of this information at the moment because some of the key information assets are held under restrictive licenses. The public's already paid for them, but we can't get at our map data at this point in time uh, easily. Uh, we'll come on to that. Uh, this is the Afghanistan elections. This was uh, some wonderful information that was gathered and was held to account the fact that there was obviously something funny going on in the various wards and postings. That open data was one of the reasons that the whole damn rerun had to be reheld. Extraordinarily powerful. My favourite one is actually something that makes my kind of, uh, I, think, I think just makes you... Uh, No, it's not gets too big. Okay, sorry about this. This is OpenStreetMap. This is a lovely visualization that's been done of the... This is through time, so this is January through uh, December 2009. These are the open 
data uploads to OpenStreetMap of geography in the world. So light is more mapping, okay? Um, as you go through the world, communities are building geographies. Sometimes governments release the data and you don't have to do the bloody effort for yourselves, you know, okay, if, 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 if countries do that. This is Haiti. This was the Haiti map before the earthquake. Very little definition at all here, okay? Open data, what happened? We have an open data platform. Uh, there was an appeal to get high level, high resolution satellite imagery released. Uh, and this is the visualization, earthquake's gonna happen here and we're gonna see the uh, open street map uploads occurring here. These are days, I mean this is happening in 24 hour periods. And as you go through, you start to notice that Port-au-Prince is being mapped, is being mapped to a level of precision and detail that is game-changing. The map we started with, and just a little while longer, the map we now have, which is an essential resource. It turns out, of course, that all the aid agencies now use that open resource to actually manage the whole relief effort. With the former map, you wouldn't have been able to map where the refugee tents and the food centers were. So you look at that and you ask yourself, what is this going to do to the context of power and information sharing? And the, just, just, just to wrap up, what we have been doing with data.gov.uk is really quite a surprising thing. The UK is not known for being open about data, okay, at all. Um, and, uh, you know, we were able to kind of show that, you know, right back in the 19th century, one John Snow's maps of cholera outbreak turned out to identify cholera as a waterborne problem uh, through to our bicycle, ba bicycle accident maps. We got the in, partly through Tim's charisma, I have to say, to basically Brown said to us, okay, let's make non-personal public data available. Let's just do it. Okay, let's do it for transparency and accountability. Let's do it for the issue of improving public service delivery because you can name and shame in all sorts of interesting ways and assess people holding to account. And perhaps you can even generate economic and social capital. Um, along the way, we've been having to fight battles with restrictive licenses, but the site was launched, as Wendy said, on the 21st of January. Been working very hard on this. And um, what we now have is 3,000 data sets Everything from some surprisingly sensitive ones. I mean, at aggregate statistics level, so they don't identify people. Some of this data was already there. So we have an Office of National Statistics that produces a lot of stuff, or uh, NHS Choices that produces it for health. Or some local council has a PDF file that contains the information, but it's no good to us because we can't link to it. We can't connect it. So the thing we're looking to do is both publish data openly, but publish it using these linked data standards. That is the thing. Not all the data, not the 3,000 databases that we have are all available in that linked data form because we're having to actually educate people into how to publish this stuff, show them that it's a small addition to what they already have to do, that we have to develop ontologies to describe in a stable way. There are no agreed ways of describing schooling or road structures or councils have different ways of describing their activities in local authority areas and so on. So the joining up we're doing here is really exciting. We, we, we are having applications now added from an external groups who are repurposing this data in ways that government never could do. So it's a bit like the Applications for America idea, that you can energize people to get involved, um, suggesting ideas. And there really is a sparkle endpoint here. I mean, we can go and I can put a, I can put a linked data query into these data sets for those that have been converted and answer questions. So, for example, just to give you a sense of this, what might there be? Uh, and this, is, I think, is the difference between our effort here and in, the, and, and in the U.S., is that we've been lucky enough to have that mandated as a standard. So, um, for example, This is a URL for one of our schools, okay? One of our schools in the educational database, I don't know, it's a school with a URI now. This is officially minted, so we've actually got them to be designing these things in perpetuity, okay? Um, and we might be able to find something out about that in terms of its composition. So 
a census record. This school would have had a census taken, and that is telling us just who were there in terms of various age groups in that particular school. Um, now, this is a much freer form than the data locked up inside spreadsheets, typically, and the data inside uh, large relational databases. Every school now in Britain will be defined by yeah. the Every... background or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we can get at the data that they hold about all those schools. Yeah? So wherever there is information being put into the, what's called the edubase data sets, we'll be able to access it. So every school has got a URI. And all the elements within the school, and same thing for transport. Now... People say, oh, this is incredibly, you know, sounds Napoleonic for God's sake. But actually, these ontologies change. There's a different one for education than there is for uh, environment and fisheries. There's a different one. And the join points are what you're looking for. Where are the same as links? A lot of it comes down to administrative geography. The fact that there is a way of referring to a ward or a particular region or a health authority. So those are where the join points are. I can also link to the external resources in the open link data web like DPpedia. So I could look at what the school says on DPpedia if it has an entry, and all of them do, it turns out, because somebody's done an entry for this stuff. And it doesn't always have the data that they would have in the official statistics. Uh, very interesting issues there. So just to wrap up on this... Um, so the applications that we're trying to build are... You know, you don't want to see sparkle endpoints. What you might want to see is how the government's spending your average tax per day uh, on things like the National Health Service, which is indeed a very high uh, amount of our uh, income, but we're very proud of it. Um, banks, <laughs> no, recapitalizing the banks, or museums, thruppence, or indeed uh, the Afghanistan conflict and so on. Um, this is interesting data. This is data taken from the transport domain now, users link data. This is the London congestion zone. Uh, these are vehicle types. This is, red is a, a, um, an increase, sorry, um, re, uh, red is a decrease and blue is an increase. So from 2001 to 2008, you can see that cars and taxis and HGVs, particularly cars and taxis, went down dramatically and bicycles went up, you know. That's come from a bunch of tedious census data, another traffic data that is now open. People can then begin to use that and repurpose it in different ways. I've talked about the, uh, the, the, the postcode data. Um, this is now what's happening. Literally in the last couple of weeks, we're seeing people build apps. This is a godsend. This is an iPhone app that tells you where your local NHS dentist is. Sadly, a lot of our dentists are now private, as they are here. But there are a few who will give you NHS, but you try and find where they are uh, off of any official listings. It's almost impossible. Um, more controversially, just recently, we got the ASBOrometer. ASBO is an antisocial banning order. It's a little piece of social engineering we have in the UK where you're told you can't go out. You're curfewed, essentially, as being a... You can't go out. You, antisocial banning order. You can't go out after certain hours. You're curfewed. Okay. 70-year-olds have antisocial banning orders just as much as 18-year-olds, it turns out, or some do. Okay. But this application shows you what your region is like in terms of ASBO statistics. So you can worry whether you're in a, in a higher or low ASBO zone. This was data, again, that was completely interred with inside governmental statistics until this move. So we're excited by this. It may not be such a big deal in the US. Let me tell you, we have very few. I mean, the federal uh, disposition to publish is stronger, more established here. Well, I don't know. We could argue about it. Uh, <laughs> but the idea here is that in the UK, the public body, that public services should publish all non-personal data as a matter of principle, not, a kind of, not under some duress of a freedom of information request, is, is quite a powerful new political rhetoric. And in fact, subsequent to our efforts, we had this piece in The Guardian, on the editorial of The Guardian, which was actually talking about the efforts, saying, you know, it's, it's hard to know how free a data will withdraw the boundaries between different communities or recast their relationship with power. But it's reasonable to speculate that the uncovering and locking of so much information will drive improvements in public policy. It'll level the territory in which voters meet politicians and could prove a powerful break on campaigning hyperbole in the coming election. Without the printed word, there wouldn't have been an informed electorate, no demand for accountability, and indeed no democracy at all. And the question is, is open data that important? Actually, I think you can argue it could be. And I, I just want to share my excitement 
with you about that, and I think also people like Jim in the US are trying to do something similar. Yeah. Um, finally, let me just show you one final thing. I shouldn't have done this. Um, this is, uh, we're now at the stage actually where, where there's enough of this going on that we can compare the efforts. So this is, um, this is data.gov.uk. We basically, because this is a self-describing catalog, we can harvest the RDF that describes the catalog. That's what data.gov.uk is. Uh, and so we can actually see that the data sets, the 3,000 data sets that are in there at the moment are quite dominated by health, school, um, interesting. We've done a similar job. We've had to crawl this from, from uh, uh, do a little bit of work on this. This is the US. US data is primarily about environmental control, toxic release. It's quite an interesting, different, different emphasis. Um, the Australian effort, in a similar way, it's largely about geography and, and, uh, and legal assistance. Okay. So there are, you know, there are different flavors of this even now coming through. But we can begin to do this. Uh, because the intriguing thing ultimately is that what would it mean to be able to compare the crime statistics in one neighborhood in the US with the crime statistics in a similar neighborhood, in, in a neighborhood in the UK? Is that even becoming, going to start to become meaningful? The kind of hard work that sociologists and demographers have done in the past, is this a new kind of tool and opportunity? So that's me. Yeah. Yes, yes. Now, the second question is, probably we can go one step further and have the, that, the raw data, because all of that is extracted from documents. Yes. That, for example, the bicycle accident, well, that you need the document, but pollution, for example, in one, you have a sensor in the middle of London, yes. which is picking up a data point, and this data point immediately fed into one, one of his URI. Could be, yes. I mean, that would be one model. Very yeah. item, bad day, bad minute. Could be. Could be. So, 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 so the two things to say is, um, if we looked at the prefix bits of those Sparkle queries, there were things like DC. That stands for the Dublin Core Ontology. So I can go to that particular resource and see how the publishing world wants to define things like copyright or publication date or author or co-author or institution. Uh, I can go to another ontology site and pick the one that has to do with, well, education or whatever. So you are blending these vocabularies in your, in your information you bring in together. And the issue about grain size is, yes, in a sense, uh, there is no reason why you shouldn't be taking your eyes directly off the sensor or the individual. Now, you know, the, re the area of this gets very interesting. So you talk about the Tardian dream, uh, and, uh, and that's, I think, it, you know, in your talk last night, the bits I was, I was awake for most of it, but the bit I remember was you saying exactly, you know, what does it mean to get down to an individual association of these particular interests and engagements with, 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 with the world? Yes, you could do that. Of course, what our Office of National Statistics worries about is privacy. They worry about aggregating statistics, not disaggregating them. And yet the power in some sense, is for the individual to, to understand what is known or collected or relates to them. They're not any longer a demographic type. They're them. And that, that, that is absolutely the case. Yeah. Like, for instance, in America, there is a, a very um, 
call it controversial kind of application about the sex predators. So actually yeah. You can yeah. Online. GeorgiaSexOffenders.com exactly. is the one I know. Exactly. Yes. Mm. In online, and some of them, by the way, are yeah. usually youngsters that yeah. just touched a, a lady at the age of 17 and they became sex predators, uh, according to the. And, and that puts a little bit of, you know, a, a breach to their privacy. So, so by openness, I, I'm fully mm. into the openness, but what kind of mechanism can we allow people? So I think that's entirely in play. So, I mean, just to come back also to the question um, uh, about this is a very read-oriented, feels like a very read-oriented web. So where's the, where's the engagement piece? I mean, it's entirely possible for the user to generate RDF and linked data about themselves and their interests. In fact, these graphs are, are very um, rich in terms of the predicate types that are around. This is not a simple set of... X knows Y or is known by Y. Um, of course, it's interesting when you look at the distribution of these terms, just how dominant some are. Um, and it is certainly the case that the early efforts to give power to individuals to write linked data about themselves largely failed, actually. So friend of a friend or the FOF uh, movement, there are tens of millions of these files in existence, but most people don't know they've got a faux file because it's auto-generated, for example, by Flickr or by Yahoo uh, when you register with them. Um, the issue about um, how much information in this form is or is not within your purview or your control, and the interesting thing is this is why government data is quite good for this because there's some kind of general governmental, con there's a consensus presumably between the governed and the, you know, those in power that some information should be available or should not. At the edges, that will be very edgy conversation because are we happy with all of this information going out there uncontrolled? Uh, are we happy to see MPs' expenses? Yes, we are, actually. Okay. So now, you know... The question, the mm. question is, do you have in the Semantic Web Project mechanisms that in case like society decides that this is a, a, a issue that we should be more tightly controlled, yeah. what can we do? Are we still want to use it? You don't, you, don't, you don't have to build an extranet. This doesn't have to be a linked data web that everybody can read uh, with equivalent permissions. So just as there was, uh, you know, there were local walled gardens of information in intranet technology, there will be in this space too, yeah. Whether you can be more selective about the trust or the accountability uh, machinery so that you choose to reveal some of the descriptions if you have a certain policy that will allow some people to see it and not others, that's, that machinery is, is hard and difficult and is a matter of research. But, yeah. So at the very beginning of this, it's, you know, we are at where we were with the web in 94. We don't know how it's going to work out. We don't have the tools and technologies we need to make sense of it all. And you know, part of what we're trying to do is, is um, I mean, this could stall out. I mean, it's not big enough to be... A sh and, and indeed, when you start to look at what the big players are doing, so Google, for example, routinely indexes and harvests RDF now, didn't. Um, it only chooses to take notice at a certain size of scale. Uh, same with microformats. You know, if you become important enough, then, then you'll be drawn to attention of these various agencies. Uh, a lot of the big players are slow to produce tools to help you visualize or, or navigate or contribute to this. So it is interesting in that the incubator env environment, the open link data as the environment which has given rise to this, is now being energized by this government transparency initiative too. I think it's an interesting set of drivers on, on the process. Um, practical thing. I, I am very, very involved in what the government of Catalonia is doing exactly doing that, trying to do that. Mm. Of course, uh, even if I told them about uh, science, etc., uh, for the moment they have, they are working with Google. Yeah, yeah, to, to do that. yeah, they are. Uh, mm. uh, <laughs> I, I, what I say, uh, but specifically speaking, what do you think is the main difference about you doing this with the British government? Well, I have to say that, um, how can I put it? Um, open proprietary standards are what this is based on, okay? Um, that open non-proprietary standards are what this is based on. <laughs> Sorry, I misspoke. Um, yeah, absolutely that. So, um, and that in some sense, 
this information where it lives. I mean, as this data sets get bigger and bigger, they're going to be hosted on government-maintained Amazon clouds, I suspect, of various sorts. It's not, there's a lot of machinery to put in place. Uh, but to simply hand over responsibility for managing your health or educational records, it's a choice that's perfectly open to, 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 uh, to governments to take. Uh, and maybe people feel much more comfortable with Google playing that role. But all I would say is that um, governments also have a rule and responsibility to be, to enable in fact, Jörg and I talked about this a bit yesterday. This whole notion of data portability is a crucial issue in this world. Um, and the interest of many of these corporations is to make stickiness work so that it's hard to move your information from one place to another. Um, the entire principle in this model is that it is entirely transparent how and straightforward to invoke data portability. So that is always my question is how hard will it be to get disinter all this information and redeposit or re-represent it in some other format. And that's the question I would address. Yeah. Just back to a question. Who's, uh, who's working on this in the uh, Obama administration? The Obama administration has not adopted linked data as the standard. In fact, they talk about machine-readable formats. So Vivek Kundra and Anish and people are talking about the effort to get data up there. But if you go to data.gov, it's a lot about big downloadable files full of stuff. Um, the, uh, the group at, uh, Handler's group at RPI, uh, have produced an equivalent for some subset of this data using linked data principles. And the environmental agency in particular within the government are looking at using these standards. So they're taking a kind of a sandpit approach, I think. There is going to possibly be, I've heard talk of a semantic dot data dot gov area using these principles, whereas we've gotten a mandate to do it from the outset. And, 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 uh, I'll, I'll ask yeah, later. yeah, sure, sure. Let me, let me yeah. push what I was trying to say yesterday about the reinvention of the newspaper. So what, what is now the new before? I mean, this is way beyond blogs now, right? Mm -hmm. yes. we, so we, we now access a space where we not only have the opinion of someone else, which is a new non-professional journalist coming in, yes, we can begin to address for you know, the Love Canal example or whatever example you, you, you cite where you get the original statistics. I mean, not the statistics precisely. You got the, grain, the small grain data point that some statisticians have already used, but that you can reuse and re-aggregate free. Yeah. This is, this is, I understand what you yeah. are saying. Yeah. Yeah. So getting into the, the data scapes now, of, I mean, it's fabulous in terms of controversy, data scapes, that can modify also the raw data. There'll be a lot of controversy around this. <laughs> um, there'll be a lot of controversy around this um, because people, in fact, we had a letter from the national, no, it's being recorded, uh, from, from the chief statistician uh, of, the ordinance, of the Office of National Statistics saying the term raw data is dangerous. Because we exist as an organization to ensure that statistics are properly understood and interpreted. And that you need to know when the data has been filled or modified or cleaned up. And you won't know that if you're just releasing raw data. And in fact, the big argument around this was that in areas like crime statistics, uh, the Office of National Statistics exists so that politicians can't pre-announce data that has not been appropriately understood and analyzed. So there is quite an interesting argument around just how raw is raw. And, uh, you know, and we've got this with climate gate. The really interesting example is this climate data issue in this space. So, um, and, and the other point is that more and more newspapers are thinking about stories from data in just this way. So they're trying to connect directly onto the data feeds to generate interesting trend stories. So New York Times are looking at it, of course. Guardian in the UK have been doing this for some time. How you relate uh, data to stories, I think, is a very interesting, and interpretation is very can interesting. I, can I give a little example just before we go on? Another story. Just picking up on what we were talking about yesterday with the collect... Uh, Lots of people doing this on Twitter trends. When we had the snow in the UK, um, it was it was more than we'd had for decades, and the systems couldn't keep up. So the, you couldn't find out when there was going to be the next train. You couldn't get through on the telephone, and you couldn't get the website went down and couldn't keep up with 
when trains were going where. But what you could look at, what was that size? UK snow. snow, Hash UK snow was one of these great things. The other thing about snow, of course, it's incredibly local. So it can be snowing in one area, and the weather, the Met Office won't know whether it's snowing two miles down the road, and there's no model that can predict so hash it. Hash UK snow is Twitter, mm. everybody's saying it's snowing here. They're all a, they're all a sensor, and it's incredibly powerful. You put that out in open data, and it was immediately mm. being mashed up, and you could see on that website mm. where the snow was because everyone stuck in those traffic counts was saying, it's snowing here. <laughs> or, I'm at Waterloo and the next train is 9.15. Mm. And you couldn't get that from any, you know, this is just completely different. This is, this is going to be, this is when we're starting to write data. You know, we, Nigel said we're at the moment with the read leak data. Mm. We will quite soon get to write leak data. The, the same thing happened uh, here in California yeah. at the last big yeah. forest fire right. that we had. Right. Uh, fire up in Santa yeah, Barbara, yeah, yeah. and the people were all on the periphery uh, of the fire, indicating why it could have been. Yeah. They put people are great sensors. Yeah. They are great sensors. It made yeah. a tremendous difference in, in their, the ability of the responders to mm -hmm. what was going on. Yeah, and I think this raises this raises some huge challenges, and they're not necessarily again not the semantic web's problem in a way, but in terms of in terms of application. But that it's sort of at least in two areas that are related to the specific topic. And one is one is keeping track of information about what you don't have. Yeah. I mean, this is a central task of statistics, right? And they, yeah. when humans try to reason, they reason in a confirmatory way, and um, they look at what's there and they don't think about what's not there. Um, and that's that's a, a sort of a, a, a classic thing that's very hard to train people out of. We try to do in PhD programs with limited success. Mm. Mm. Um, and if you give people the ability to just mine stuff, mm. they will make horrible decisions mm. with very high probability. Mm. So the question is, you know, and I mean, I've seen another thing that sort of reminds me of this as well. There's a project at, at IBM, and I'm not liking the name, but uh, many basically eyes. they have this um, many, many eyes, many eyes mm. things where people have basically have devices that are recording everything all the time and the idea is they're going to give this to managers and organizations allow them to do what they call analysis queries so you could ask things like okay what did we do before we landed our five bi biggest contracts you know well they're going to come back well you all wore red ties you know and, and, <laughs> and that's why now when we all wear red ties so, so there's sort of a huge challenge to when you track of the now the province of information sort of sampling information and what's not there which is what your statisticians were Concerned about it, yep. rightly so. Yeah, yeah. But then also to try to figure out how do we build apps to encourage people to process the information intelligently. And there's an educational issue yes. that I mean, mm -hmm. it's not yes. unique to this. It is true. Thing. It is true. But the and technology I, is advancing yeah. faster than, than people's knowledge. About and I think that's a, it's absolutely a great question, uh, a concern. Um, and, and you hear it literally when we presented this to the cabinet. The, we had people on the table said, you cannot give this information out because people will interpret it in the wrong way or in diff or ways we can't control. And you hear that and you think, no, hang on, no, hang on. But you are right. I mean, there will have to be a, um, a, a dialogue, a discussion, an engagement about ways of discussing things. But that happens already. I can take the same set of statistics and read about them in the Daily Mail or the Sun newspaper or the Guardian, and it isn't the same spin. I mean, it's whether it's birth statistics or immigration... Um, and, and the flaws in the nature of the sampling or the partial reporting, all that stuff will be there. Um, and we, uh, this kind of data literacy is really fundamental. I'm, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It's, it's a general problem, but it's just that you can see quantitatively, qualitatively may already be there, but quantitatively yeah. you can see this cranking yeah. it up. And so yeah, we it will. And crank up it will. the education and it to will. try to make yeah. people cope with that. But, but it's also the link between qualitative and quantitative, which is modified. That's precisely the interesting point. People might have difficulty interpreting quantitative statistics, but the possibility of navigating back to the qualitative local element makes a big difference. That's precisely a very big change. You will be held accountable for the way you use this information, or you can in principle. That is the point. Yeah, yeah. And if yeah. it's... Yeah, sorry. No, I, 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 just a small point. I mean, this is very similar to the concern I think people have with the web and how can you trust anything that anybody can publish and nobody knows you're a doll. And the answer is we develop a combination of technical, social, organizational mechanisms to help. Yeah. And there's a lot of crap out there. Yeah. And so there are a lot of people who believe in a lot of crap. But at the same time, this is the sort of thing that where you get an organization like Sunlight Foundation yeah. building apps yeah. on being yeah. able to, to use the critique back to the question of, of the new journalism. Not so much the, what the New York Times and The Guardian will do as much as the degree to which, for example, you can replace local newspapers 
uh, with local laws in a way that, that just makes it much, much, much cheaper to do. Yeah, that's why the postcode paper is so interesting, because that right. really... That, that, that kind of reinvents a form of... Also, as a print medium, it's pretty powerful because not everybody... We have, a dis, we, have a, we have a disqualified minority in the UK who can't get access to the web. Yeah. This is why we argue for web sites. We argue that people, we need a group of people who can understand these issues, that companies will need them, who are trying to work in this area, that governments will need them. To have these sorts of discussions, look at trends, look at scenarios, think about the good way it could go and the bad way it could go, analyze, you know, just skills that we don't actually teach at the moment in, on a computer science course or an information science course, um, information systems course. That's what we argue. And just to come back to the kind of, uh, what, 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 I, what I think we're very interested, I'm very interested in in, 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 in this audience is, is what can we, what can you help us with in understanding how this will empower, disempower, what, do the, will these networks be weird in some way? Will it be easy to understand what the privileged ones are, to understand you know, the shape and traffic? Yeah. No, just, we just don't know. I think, I think we should kind of wrap this up. Yep. It strikes me that the session this morning uh, is a real uh, illustration of something that's obviously an object of study for those of us who are interested in looking at network society, and, but it's also, by doing so, also a great opportunity of, of data that we do. It's a whole of those things that are really incredible. So thank you again for